Football League. You can take away the bands, the, the fans, and the TV cameras, and I'd still go out there and play. When you come out of the huddle, and you know, a guy will be running toward him. Wham, boy! I always felt that after you went through all that work, the only thing you had to show for it was the film. And you got to keep the film. I mean, that's the backbone. That's what it all goes back to. That's the heritage, the film. The old Bibles, the bones in the ground, they dig them up. We have a great fellowship with the Green Bay Packers. There's a feeling of one for the other on the club. Really, when I had a chance to play professional football and the respect and all the good things that go with it, it was more than a dream that, that came true for me. When the 1966 season began, we were officially NFL Films. And it was an exciting time for us then. We were now part of the National Football League and we were learning this new profession, making football movies. Our action coverage was improving. We bought new equipment. We now had telephoto lenses and high-speed cameras to experiment with. And also, we started to use sound. In The Lost Treasures, we found some of our first crude attempts to work audio into our films. But we felt sound was vital because we wanted to interview the players. We wanted to learn more about them as people about their childhood, their families, their hobbies. But we weren't sure how or where to start. In the 1960s, the only thing we knew about sound was the way television used it. Television wanted to promote their announcers, so they were always on camera. The guy asking the questions, like a young Pat Summerall here, was almost as important as the players and the coaches. We didn't care about the upcoming game. We were interested in more generic information. I mean, we, we weren't trained as journalists, we weren't reporters. So what we would end up doing was we'd rent a motel room someplace on a Saturday before the game. Sometimes it seemed like a high school audiovisual class. Bob Hayes couldn't make it today. But we figured as long as we're here in Dallas, I may as well do something. Morris Kelman is over here on sound. And Jack Newman is behind the camera. <laughs> Can I pick my nose now? Yeah, go ahead. Are, are we done? You know, we weren't journalists, and we didn't know how to phrase questions. And plus, we were in awe of the players. I mean, you're in the same room with Bob Hayes, who's an Olympic gold medal winner, the world's fastest human. He, he don't have the 9-1 speed, and uh, I don't have the football sense that Dan has. So, with his with his uh, 4 6 40 and my 4 4 40, it's. Good, what I wanted to ask him was how do you and Dan Reeves complement each other in the Dallas offense? That was what we wanted to, the, the question. So what I asked him was I said, Bob, how do you and Dan Reeves complement each other? Well, I'm always complimenting, it's, it's obvious, obvious that I'm always uh, complimenting uh, Reeves because he's always doing something good. My name is Ray Nitschke. I'm the middle linebacker for the Green Bay Packers. For the, for the last 10 years, I've been playing for the Packers. It seems like football has been, been good to me uh, over the years, and it's given me an education, and, and it's helped me as a man and as a father. Um, I must say that uh, cut. Just keep going. Just keep talking, right? Because I'll be able to cut. Just anything you uh, say, go ahead. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, NFL Films was doing some very different things and helping the National Football League grow. I remember uh, one time NFL Films brought a crew to Chicago to interview me. They wanted to ask me what I was doing during the offseason, which was uh, a little unusual. I was in a training program with a, an investment banking firm. I was going to be a uh, securities broker. Well, <laughs> If I expected to get dumped, I, I don't think I'd be playing a game of football, to tell you the truth. 
But at the start, uh, we were rookies at this game, and actually we were a little rough around the edges. Back then, we weren't sure whether the players should sit in one place. And that's how we basically make the snap. We were trying to get our new recording equipment to work. I'm Jerry Kramer, the right guard of the Green Bay Packers. I've been with them 10 years, starting in 1958. Now, this answer by Jerry Kramer of the Packers was a talking head without the talking part. I... So many people... Then when we got the recorder working, we almost killed them when a portable light fell down. With the attitude... Of... What makes an offensive lineman different in terms of what his qualifications Not uh, physically. Those are not the physical qualifications. So what you want to know, they're pretty obvious. Just getting a good, coherent interview was, was a challenge. I still don't know exactly what the hell you want. All right. Playing football is... And one of the first interviews we did was with the Browns captain, Dick Shafrath, and we found out that he was a hunter. So we felt, well, this would make him feel at home. We'll give him a rifle to, to clean or to stroke or whatever. I could use this gun, by the way, probably Sunday. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't look very good now, though, does it? <laughs> then we gave him a duck. That didn't work either. Uh, no. Is this all right? No, I'm fine. That's, that's... Now, here's an interview with Willie Davis of the Packers. And I found these two pop bottles in the trash. And there was a French director named Claude Lelouch. And everything that he shot, there was always something in the foreground. And it was supposed to be sort of a defocused, artistic kind of a, a foreground shot. And Willie was going to look at me through the pop bottles. Meanwhile, he, he didn't know what the hell I was doing. He was confused. He was like this. Nothing else. The whole thing was, was, was so forced and still that it didn't work out right. It was very important to me. Our sponsor was Coke, and here they saw these two Dr. Pepper bottles stuck in the front of the, you know, the lens, and they said, what the hell is this? So none of that interview was ever used because we had no idea of the concept then of, of product placement. Strange, but possibly ahead of its time. At Burger King, we're always trying to make having your way better. As the Kings meet the Panthers, followed by the Blackhawks and the Canucks. And on ESPN Classic, I Rock 1990, and a college football classic, BC versus Miami, the Doug Flutie game. Do you have all the ESPN networks? In 1966, there were only 14 NFL teams. That's just 560 players in all. Since free agency was far in the future, rosters stayed pretty much the same year in and year out. And you got to know not only the stars, but you got to know everybody. And it was an era of great names, too. You had, you know, Bookie Bolin, Buzz Nutter, Steve Stonebreaker, Joe Don Looney, and one of my personal favorites, Claude Crabb. Norm Sneed and myself got traded for Sonny Jurgensen and Jimmy Carr, knowing better in the league as Gummy. So the sports writer was saying, he just got off the phone with Gummy, and he said, Gummy, how did you feel about getting traded? And he said, well, how in the heck would you feel if you got traded for a crab? So uh, with a name like that, you know you got to take a little harassment. Then in 1966, the NFL expanded, and the Atlanta Falcons became the 15th team. Now, the expansion team then was really all renegades and roustabouts and retreads and journeymen. The Falcons had who I consider the quintessential journeyman player, number 25, Alex Hawkins. Then he was one of the first players that the Falcons selected, and he was supposed to supply some leadership and experience. So when camp started, no Hawkins. Six days went by, and Alex Hawkins had not shown up. He finally shows up to camp six days late, and Norb Hecker, who was a coach, said, you know, where were you? And Hawk said, well, I was, uh, I was caught in traffic. NFL coaches were also a different breed then. They all copied the legendary Paul Brown. He was the guy that set the tone for all the other coaches. Coaches then had the hats blocked, the trousers were creased, the shoes were polished. They dressed like high school guidance counselors who were checking hall passes. Now this worked well for most of them, 
But Abe Gibron, who was a Chicago Bear assistant, couldn't quite pull it off. And I loved Abe. And we finally called him the face that lunched a thousand shrimp. This was a time when the coach's word was law. They put in the offensive game plan. They put in the defensive game plan. And the play he called was the play that was run every time. And if that play happened to end up in the end zone, well, you'll see something else was different in 1966. Back then, if you spiked the ball or did something like that, I think your teammates would got on you right away. It just wasn't accepted. Just as the coaches of the day modeled themselves after Paul Brown, a lot of the players modeled themselves after Unitas and Jimmy Brown, and both of them were very unemotional, very undemonstrative. So when Jim Brown or John Unitas did something great, you'd never know it. That was the professional attitude of the time. You score a touchdown, well, hell, that's your job. You give the ball to the ref, you go back to the bench, and that's it. There's no gyrating and jumping and dancing. That was Bush League, and that was high school Harry. We were a pretty reserved group back then. Uh, we did not spike the ball or throw it up into the stands. They would maybe slap you on the backside, smack your helmet, but none of this crazy celebrations that uh, go on today. No threat of a 15-yard penalty for exuberance. We tried to save our energy. We didn't all race to the end zone, especially if it was a long pass play. We weren't smart enough to be showmen in those days. Today is entertainment. Give me a break. <laughs> These guys are entertainers. They make a tackle and they squirm all over. Uh, they have press conferences afterwards. This is entertainment. I don't cherish and celebrate all of that, what I call tomfoolery. I know I sound like an old fogey, I'm sorry, but you're paid to score the touchdown. That's what you're out there to do. So act like you've been there before, like it's no big deal. I'll be back before the day's over, I'll come back again. We were supposed to put him on his back. I mean, it was not something that we would jump up and celebrate about. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, it was more like this clock that's running in your head. You know, every time the ball is snapped, you're, you're 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and you better be there. Camera roll 14, roll one of Jim Marshall interview. Oh, that's good, wasn't it? Here's a guy that really intrigued me. He was a, a rugged renaissance man, I guess you could say. And when he told me that he could ski, we decided to take him to Aspen, Colorado to do a feature. Well, he looked the part all right, but not only couldn't he ski, he could barely stand up on snowshoes. I played the part of the adventurer, and the first thing that we went to do was, was, was skiing. And I could ski, but not to his satisfaction. He told me, hell, you have me come out here, bring you out here to Aspen, Colorado, and you can't ski where it's <laughs> You know how Steve is, he's always looking for, for an angle, for a gimmick. I saw the goal line uh, ahead of me. I saw the goal post and nothing there but but land. And so I cut down the distance between uh, the goal line and uh, those, well. You cut, down the, you cut down the distance between the goal line and, and yourself. Then what happened? Oh, it's a I can't think. Um, I cut down the, no, let, I don't want to say that. The fire's um, crackling in the background. The sound man's very, upset. Very Jim was so um, tired out from all the stuff we'd done out in the, in the snow, and, and he was frustrated, and I was still pissed off at him from the, from, the, from the skiing incident. All of us got exasperated, and finally we just threw up our hands and never used any of the interview at all. He can... Uh, wait a minute. Cut it off for a minute. Wait a minute. That he is... Uh, <laughs> he's rolling the f***ing camera. Yeah, too. <laughs> <laughs> there is some similarity between. Uh, stop it, Nance. Damn. Come on. <laughs> man, this is hard, man. Picking my brain, man. I don't want to well, run down in there. Steve and his dad, Ed, uh, always great people. Uh, I'd like to call them my friends, especially if Steve gives me some residuals for using my voice for 25 years. My name's Anthony Sullivan, and here's another great invention for around the house. It's called the Tap Light. Just tap, and you've got light. Tap Light conveniently sits or mounts anywhere. You can wall mount tap lights as well for places where you need just a little extra illumination but don't have a light fixture, like this closet. Tap Light gives you the right light where and when you want. Utility Wagon from Subaru. This is ESPN Classic. 
here I was, loving what I was doing, didn't care about vacations or weekends. I wanted to be out there doing football movies. And I didn't realize, or didn't even look into the future that much to say, oh, someday this is going to get huge and we're going to have this and we're going to have that. Of course, I never thought about that. I just said, let's keep going. We need more space. Let's go rent a building. We need better equipment. Let's buy another camera. One piece of new equipment that paid off was the zoom lens. And it was great for reaching out and pulling in a close-up that we would have missed otherwise. In the past, in order to get a close-up of a player, you have to get, you know, really close to him. That was uncomfortable for us, and it was even more uncomfortable for the player. And then, you know, once in a while, you'd get the eyebrow, a look from a guy, and you'd know you better get the hell out of there. And it led to poorly framed shots like this bloody nose. The new lenses were great. We could zoom in to get low angle shots or we could zoom back to get storytelling shots. But the zoom could also be overused. The zoom lens came out and it was a great idea except most cameramen thought it was a trombone. And that's the way they started to use it. And then you go bing, 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 and every, you just go all over the place. But when it was used right, the zoom's effect was powerful and it was subtle. Now, this shot's a great example. We're zoomed in tight as the play begins. Then as Fran Tarkinen scrambles toward us, we zoom back a little, keep him framed head to toe, keep his full body in the frame, and then we pull even wider as he crosses the goal line. And then we zoom into the ref signal. There was another new camera lens that we were experimenting with in 1966. And at the end of this play, you can see the first NFL film's telephoto lens. The famous French Impressionist Paul Cezanne once said that all art is selected detail. These big, long lenses could bring a certain detail to the game that had never been seen before. Uh, I don't think anybody in those days uh, in television had the luxury of extremely what we call long lenses. They're telephoto lenses where you could bring the action right up to you. And I said, look, we can't copy television. We've got to do it something different. We've got to get in closer to the game. We've got to get to the faces to the eyes there were not many people who were able to do that and there was a lot of experimentation and that to the credit of nfl films and and ed sable he allowed steve the versatility and the latitude to experiment and steve was tenacious he would stick with something he wouldn't say no and the close-ups mixed with the long shots gave us a completely new look and everybody could tell the difference when we were shooting a game and when it was a television game. They put their imprint on it and, and their imprimatur and, uh, and now everybody else in the country is copying them. The objective of the first long lens was almost like a still camera, just to show these little details. We ended up a lot of times just shooting linemen or kickers, because kickers hardly ever moved. Cleveland's Lou Groza, the toe, he was the quintessential 1960s kicker, head on and actually bigger than the guys trying to block his kicks. But he was 270, 6'4", big meaty leg. He came, when he hit it, he just went, boom. He didn't have to worry about, you know, how far he was going to kick it. It's just yeah, how straight he was going to kick it. He was focused. I think the word they use now is focused. He was focused on the football. Probably the same thing that makes golfers great golfers. Great golfers are generally dull. And it's about all they have to do is to hit the ball. Hit the ball. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do now? Hit the ball. You know, that. <laughs> how far are you going to hit it? I don't know. If you don't shut up, I won't be able to hit the ball. <laughs> you know? Sam Baker, who I had the opportunity to play with Philadelphia, great character in the NFL. And uh, back there, those guys had to play a whole game. So it was. Uh, tough to, to have to kick a field goal in the fourth quarter when you played the whole game. Your leg was a little tired. I started kicking because the kicker got hurt and they needed a kicker. And they said, uh, you're our kicker. Well, I was a fullback, a back, running back at the same time. And of course, if you missed a couple on Sunday, you never saw so many kickers on Tuesday. There, everybody on the team was a kicker on Tuesday if you didn't play well. For some reason, no one had come up with the idea of putting up nets behind the goalposts. So every field goal went into the stands and, and turned into a WWF Texas death match. It gave every fan there an excuse to start trading blows, to, you know, to get in, have a little physical contact of their own. So you end up with these incredible melees. Now, when cops weren't breaking up these brawls, uh, the cops took on another role. 
Uh, in stadiums like Philadelphia's Franklin Field, where the stands were out of the kicker's reach, the cops became designated catchers. In Minnesota's Metropolitan Stadium, ushers competed for the weekly honor of fielding kicks. And I think this guy, I think he won on style points. The most memorable of all, of all the catchers, there was this guy in Cleveland. Every Browns game, ball would be kicked, and there was Abraham Abraham in that brown suit catching the ball. He was a legend of the 60s. Do you remember Abraham Abraham? <laughs> If I got to say I do because who's going to forget Abraham Abraham? No, 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 I don't. <laughs> Abraham Abraham? Was he a player? <laughs> no, he was a guy, a hot dog salesman, right? He sold hot dogs. In a brown suit behind the, yes, that was Abraham Abraham? A little, little tiny guy running around behind the goal post after extra points and field goals and stuff and grabbing the football. Yes, I remember. Why does he do that? <laughs> a biblical figure, no doubt. <laughs> kind of like he wasn't swallowed by the whale, he had to chase footballs. It was destiny. It was his destiny. <laughs> the destiny of these straight-ahead kickers took a turn for the worst in 1966. The Redskins hired Charlie Gogolak, who was everything Lou Groza and Sam Baker weren't. He was skinny, he was frail, he went to an Ivy League college, and he kicked from the side. And Charlie's older brother, Pete, was the NFL's first soccer-style kicker, and he was signed by the New York Giants. Then when people realized how accurate they were, every team went looking for a soccer-style kicker of their own. A cold wind was blowing for the big men with the square toes, and within the next few years, they would be gone forever. Hi, I'm Doug Flutie, pro football player and father of an autistic child. I started the Doug Flutie Jr. Foundation to help less fortunate families of autistic children get the support they need. Here's a way you can help. Just dial 1010-220. All calls up to 20 minutes are only 99 cents, and 1010-220 will make a donation to the Doug Flutie Jr. Foundation every time you use it. So dial 1010-220. Get up to 20 minutes for only 99 cents and help some great kids. Once we got the hang of talking heads, we tried for more. Rosie Greer was a huge defensive tackle for the Rams. He was also a recording artist, sort of. Down, roll, three. Rosie Greer. Steve. Okay, Rosie, this is track number one. The tape is rolling, count it down. State the title. Again. Okay, Rosie, this is track number one. No, 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 not again. I want to, I want to, go ahead, once more, please. Okay, Rosie, this is track number one. You want to state the title and count it down. Take this road. People make the world what it is. Well, the first thing that I remember about Rosie Greer was his weight. And you could tell his weight by the, the rolls in the back of his neck. I mean, if he had one roll in the back of his neck, that weight meant he weighed about 280. If he had two rolls in the back of his neck, that meant he was over 300. And I think when our director got into a question about his weight or something, that uh, uh, soured Rosie a little bit. And it took us a while to, you know, get the mood back to the, to the, the music, which was the feature of the piece. Well, I think that you're probably going to be one of the most impressive cabaret singers at 320 pounds. So, I mean, can your audience, they're not going to boo you. Well, I don't expect to be, I don't expect I am 320 pounds. Yeah, you're blowing up a little bit there. Uh, shock and I'm going to talk to you after with my elbow <laughs> but really uh, I think I'm close to 290 maybe 295 football is football as you're out there trying to kill somebody and music I think is a kind of a love thing I mean, you just play it and you sing and you hope people enjoy it and I just want to have everybody say amen you want another tape roll? No, I think that we got enough. Want to play? We also wanted to show the players in a candid domestic Hello, setting. Hey, this is Bruce Bosley. Uh, I just called him to tell you that, and to tell Ernie that uh, they're filming this morning, so I'll be late getting in. Uh, the practice is at 1.30. I'll be there for that. Okay, coach. Thank you. We weren't trained as directors. They had never had this experience before, so the whole thing looked like sort of a bad episode from Leave it to Beaver, and it, it never worked at all. Bruce? Yes? 
I really think we should do something about that beam. What's wrong with that beam? Well, it just isn't compatible with the rest of the decor. What do you mean it's not compatible? It doesn't th look right. I think it's uh, with a it's it's a link from the beginning of the house. It uh, has a lot to do with the character and and it means a lot. It was original truss. I don't think we should do anything to it. Are you serious? Cut. <laughs> the Steelers had a tight end by the name of John Hilton. And we found out that in the off-season, he worked in a steel mill. So what a great tie-in. Here's a Pittsburgh Steeler who in the off-season worked in a steel mill. So he said, well, this is great. This is going to be a great piece. Our director of photography, Mo Kelman, had read one of those filmmakers' guides about real movies and how you had to use a wide shot, a medium shot, and a tight shot. And what did come out looked like one of those really bad instructional films on how to handle, you know, people in a management situation. Hello, Bill. How are you, Dave? It's fine. Good. Where are we going this morning? Oh, it's five. Looking back, uh, it may have been a little bit stilted, but the real problem came is when we went into the actual steel mill itself. And we were going to do part of the interview in there, but no one ever told us what went on inside of a steel mill. And you had the metal clanging, the molten lava there is bubbling up. He couldn't hear a word, he said. And then, you know, he's trying to scream to get over the ambient sound. Imagine that John Hilton's. This is ESPN Classic. By 1967, our handheld cameramen were starting to get the feel for covering a whole game from the sideline. Uh, their shots were steadier, they were better framed. Also, they were getting a higher percentage of usable footage from each camera. They were using the zoom better, and instead of five or ten good shots a week, we started to see 40 or 50 good shots, including all these we're showing for the first time in Lost Treasures. Also, our guys were showing some guts and hanging in there when action came their way. They weren't running for cover like a matador, you know, and they just turn around like that. The most dramatic advance in our coverage that year was the new electronic high-speed cameras that we used on the sideline to slow everything down. And overnight, this super slow motion, we called it, from ground level, added um, a new grandeur, I guess you could say, to the game's greatest players. And that was a whole new world. I mean, all of a sudden, you could see facial expressions. You could see the impact of a tackle. You could see the way a quarterback held the ball. You could see the cheeks of a guy's butt ripple when he was in the line play. Everybody that saw it, I always remarked on, 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 my God, I've never seen the game like that before. People would see my dad at a banquet or something, and when they go up to talk to him, they'd come up like in slow motion like this, and they'd say, Ed Sable, glad to meet you. NFL Films came along and did things that we'd never seen before as, as an audience. And being a receiver, I can remember those shots that of a high spiraling football in slow motion through the air arcing and they follow that ball all the way down and then you see some outstretched hands catch it i just caress it boom and and then you see the player running those kinds of shots you've never seen before and so what happens is that in the nfl films if i may do this commercial for you guys but it's the truth nfl films impacted the entire sports coverage idiom they all began to mimic and do the kinds of things and shots that NFL films had brought forth another NFL trademark in the making was a group of plays that we would later call football follies and these assorted shots of players screwing up seemed sort of amusing to us especially if you group them together and use the right kind of music we decided to put a reel together and uh, maybe make a little feature out of it. But just to cover ourselves, we went up to the league office. 
and we showed it to the head of television for the league at the time, and he was a real, he was a guy, you know, wore about an eight-piece suit, Harvard graduate, real tight ass, you know, buttoned down, and he looked at these follies, and he was horrified. He turned to me and my father, and he says, how can you put something like this on the air? This is, this is degrading, it's, it's humiliating, it's embarrassing to the National Football League, and I'm, I'm surprised you would even put, even think about doing something like this. Pete Rozelle was more level-headed, and he had a sense of humor. And he told Dad that his only concern with these follies was that the players might think we were making fun of them. So uh, Dad arranged through Coach Joe Q. Herrett to have a test screening for the Philadelphia Eagles up at their summer camp in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And the film we showed them after dinner was nothing but follies, just like these. Well, we were surprised. The players loved it. And in fact, they asked to see more of them. And based on this test, Pete Rozelle gave us the go-ahead. It would be two years before we finally got enough material together to put together a half-hour show. But that became the Football Follies and became the biggest selling sports video in history. We came across one really strange game in our research between Detroit and Minnesota. For the first and the last time in NFL history, both teams came out wearing white jerseys. Fred Zamberletti was the Vikings trainer then, and he's the trainer now. Here's what happened. The Vikings wanted to show the fans what our road uniforms looked like. And we always on the road wore purple pants and white jerseys. The equipment man from the Detroit Lions and Stubby Eason from the Minnesota Vikings somehow miscommunicated. And we, when we went out, both teams had white jerseys on. Van Brocklin solved the problem by ordering one of our drivers to grab our purple jerseys. So he took off. Heavy traffic did a heck of a job of getting all those jerseys back before the first quarter ended. And here they shuffled and we got the jerseys on. Probably the first time that you had an open air dressing room on the field. The game went on and here we were with purple pants and purple jerseys. And Van Brocklin said, you guys look like a bunch of Easter eggs out there. All that purple out there was more than what uh, the Dutchman was willing to tolerate. So that was the end of the purple pants. We lost the game 24 to 20. And uh, usually the losers always have excuses and there was nothing said about what happened. So if that happened today, the NFL would really have a big, big, big problem. I think that the game can be too computerized, so super organized and things that happen. Once in a while, a little bit of the glitch here and there uh, is not all bad. I think sometimes it le it's a lesson of life that not to take things too seriously. Meet Marcus and Sid. Somehow we lost the audio from this interview, but number 30, Bernie Casey, was one of the most articulate players I ever interviewed. I love the contest. I love the Sunday afternoon contest when you're out there, head up on the defensive back, doing as best you can to deceive and, and, and defeat him, and he to stop and, and stymie you. That was good. Other aspects of the game, I thought, were nonsense, I still think so. What really was appealing about Bernie Casey was his obvious and almost intimidating intellect, and uh, he was an artist. His interview turned out to be my biggest challenge to date. Painting is, is a, a way of life. Football has its own part in my life, but most importantly is, is art, and that, that to me is my life, as I shall, I shall always be an artist, but I know that I shall not always be a football player. Was I ever that young? <laughs> <laughs> Bernie, 30 years ago, you and I was were it sitting 30? 30. Mine. Might even be more than Word. that. <laughs> we were sitting on a mountaintop in Fullerton, California. That's correct. And I, and I was interviewing you. And the answers were at a level that I, I couldn't understand. I'm sitting there and I'm listening like this, and we're figuring, how are we going to use this? What are we going to... And it, it was so different than anything that we had before, and it, in a way, sparked ideas to say, look, this could be a whole new direction for NFL fellows. Instead of talking about blitzes and post patterns, here's someone talking about pastels and colors. Many times people will say, explain to me what you have painted. Tell me about it. And I think if I could have said it in words, I would have said it and perhaps never painted it. 
Could you sense my desperation as, as an interviewer trying to get you to connect the painting to football? Because I'm thinking, well, how are we going to connect these two? Because your paintings were abstract, and I'm trying to figure, well, well, Bernie, how do these reflect football? There was not a relation with football and painting, not, not with me. I don't try to disassociate them, but I'm not particularly concerned if they are associated. But then I asked the question about why you played the game, and your answer, I mean, no one had ever said that before. Why do you play the game? I think primarily I play football for the money. Does that sound callous? I think it is a dissonant sound of honesty. And you just had your heels dug in, and you, you weren't to say, that has nothing to do with football. And I just kept coming back to that and coming back to that. Football's a business. If I could get the money, for my paintings that I get playing football, I tell the whole NFL to get <laughs> <laughs> All right, that sort of brings that line of questioning to a close. <laughs> <laughs> Great segue, Steve. <laughs> Don Meredith, in my opinion, was the most charismatic player of the mid-60s. He was the national spokesman for Jansen Sweaters, and we went along on one of his commercial shoots. And boy, that was an education. But we really got him in tight. You know, if we get too tight on here, it's, it's not going <laughs> to... He's right in the middle of nowhere, and we see him like that and everything. What the hell is this guy doing out This lost like footage is really priceless. Check out this director from Central Casting. Get a load of this. See, I just don't want to cut him off, otherwise it might look almost like the car is, you know, running over his foot or something. Well, that's, you know, that one that we want to do is, is yeah. you know, I know is what you're getting now over is, his you're shoulder. Getting now you're getting Don Meredith hitchhiking. Right. Which, when, Which we, you gotta get, when we get down to the short strokes of editing, yeah. you may not, yeah, you may not use, you may have to go to him somehow right away. It's here coming along, then you find him, and she comes by him. It's Don and Twitter. <clears throat> Big. I want all about my facial expressions. How were they? Oh, just, you were uh, great. Huh, great. That was you really like them? Uh, you so and down. the plot for this commercial had something to do with a pretty girl, an antique car, and a hitchhiker. <laughs> Sounds like a David Lynch film. Don felt completely out of place, and in between takes, he would hang out with us and tell stories about Dick Butkus. The linebackers are Butkus and Nobus, Curtis, and... Uh, it's unreal. He do. He's crazy. And he he starts cussing when you come out of the huddle, and he's you know, guy be running toward him. Before he gets there, he starts saying, "You dirty," just and man, it wham, boy. And there was Don trapped with these models. Two of them didn't even know who the hell he was. I don't want to ask a dumb question, but what <laughs> do they say? What position do you play? Are you a back or? A lot. You're a back. A running the half back? No. What are you back? I remember the word, that's the first time I ever heard the word demographic. They were talking about, well, Don Meredith has this great demographic, and I didn't, wasn't sure what that meant, but what they meant was that he appealed to a wide group of people, and that's why they used him for this commercial. I just learned recently, the, you know, the how difference? to watch football and we enjoy did. it. Before, I never could find the ball. I really didn't know what was happening. It was the only sport I didn't understand. I was so confused. <laughs> Every time you play. Yeah, yeah, hard <laughs> now I finally know what's going on. It's a confusing game. What? <laughs> it is a confusing game. I know it. Played by a conglomeration of misfits, by the way. Thought I might throw that in there. Think of the youth of America that yeah. say, well, John Murder smokes, why can't I? This is going all over the nation, and she's telling me stuff like that, huh? Girl Girl meets boy, yeah. guy gets girl and sweaters too. Yeah, wonderful. Tell you the truth, I don't think he's done a commercial <laughs> since. Right. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did a Lipton yes. Tea commercial. And their castle on the hill filled with Jansen sweaters. How about that one, huh, Roger? Inter Sports Challenge, weeknights at 7 on ESPN Classic. Name the last team to sweep a World Series. If you can beat these guys, you know you're old school. This is ESPN Classic. Fans in the 1960s looked different. And it was more than just their hairstyles. There was no NFL properties then. So nobody wore team logos on their shirts or sweatshirts or hats. There were no cheese heads or no foam fingers. But still, each team had distinctive fans. Now look at the Bears, for example. Bear fans often looked like this guy, 
pork pie hat. He's got a sidearm. This is a fan just coming to the game. Now, Bear owner George Hallis claimed that these kind of people were not from Chicago and they shouldn't be in the Bear highlight film. So we had to shoot happy, clean-cut people from other stadiums to use in the Chicago highlights. George Hallis saw those and, I, and he said, now that's, those are Bear fans. And pretty soon, the, the best of these were seen in every highlight film. Other than cheating these fan shots, the rest of our editing in those days was really unimaginative. Just matched cuts. Hey, there's Abraham Abraham again. These examples of top to ground cutting are lost treasures that I wish stayed buried. Boy, look at this. If you made a cut in the film, it, at whatever point it was cut, it was kind of destroyed forever. And, you know, if you could splice it back together, but you'd have a jump cut. So uh, scenes were used maybe longer than they should have been at the beginning and at the end. So you were always loath to cut something for fear that you know, you'd be eating your young. But uh, uh, when, when you have all that material, I guess it, it's criminal not to use it. All filmmaking is subjective. Everything is subject to your point of view. A crowded elevator smells different to a midget because his point of view is different. And I guess, to me, my perspective on, on top to bottom cuts is they stink. <laughs> I don't like them. Boy, could we have done this? I guess so. There's my name on the credits. And the first highlight film I gave him was the Green Bay Packers. And he toiled at it and had the wheels gone, you know, the editing machine. And he was finished and he said, okay, Dad, I think you could send this out to the Packers. I sent it out to the Packers and about three or four days later, I get a call from Vince Lombardi. He says, hey, Sable, who the hell did my highlight film this year? What, your 10-year-old son do this? This is awful. I'm shipping it back. Steve got embarrassed. I said, well, look, I'm going to help you and we'll get Dan Endy to help you and we're just going to do it again and send it back out again, which we did. And then he liked it. But there's one name that uh, always seems obscure or overlooked in my view, and that is the contribution that a gentleman named Yoshio Kishi made. He was the one who came in to NFL Films, and he worked with Steve Sable on the production of, they call it, Pro Football. He just appeared one day, and, and that happened a lot of NFL Films. So, you know, somebody would come in off the street, or, or uh, there was no great formal introduction. This guy was just here, and this is what he's going to do, and okay, go ahead ahead and do it. Uh, I mean, he had never seen a football game, so to come in and be immersed in that uh, amount of material, and heretofore, the editing style was, you know, strictly the play begins, the play ends. Well, Yoshio uh, had a film background and a film training and realized that the apex of the play was, you know, where the ball is at a given time, either a receiver catching it, a quarterback throwing it, uh, and you didn't have to use the long count at the line of scrimmage or the, the disassembly of the pile and all that stuff and that was really uh, the beginning or th of the of the revolution in film editing at NFL films my initial reaction to it was well uh, what they've done is is made a 26 minute montage but it moved it had action and I think that style uh, exists today in the spring of 1967 we produced they call it pro football and it was the first film to combine all the elements that we've been working on since the company started this was the citizen kane of football movies and pete rosell came up to me after that film and he said you know that's not a highlight that's a movie the nfl is online at www.nfl.com for more Log on to ESPN.com, part of Go Network, go.com. ESPN Classic thanks you for watching this presentation of the National Football League. Are you taking Zara Foley too lightly? Why would you say that? This is ESPN Classic. This is ESPN Classic. Only in Denver could a brown dog attend a football game and root against Cleveland. And only in Denver's Mile High Stadium could the AFC's best team at home.